Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, bringing you the second half of our 2D chord study from Table 2 of Rimsky-Korsakov's Principles of Orchestration. If this is your first look at this little series of chords, I urge you to jump back and watch the preceding videos just to get up to speed. And now, let's get straight back into it. In the previous chord from Table 2, we witnessed how downplaying the root could create an intense, somewhat ferocious sound. Here in this chord from the opera Legend of Tsar Sultan, we see the exact opposite. Rimsky-Korsakov wants to sit on that root quite hard, while of course letting the other pitches of the chord shine through to keep the ending of the passage triumphant. And we witnessed the reason for that in the recording we just heard, with the two singers singing their high A flats. They have to stay in tune with each other and with the orchestra, all the while fighting the natural tendency of their ears to shut out other sounds while they're singing very high, loud pitches. So it's all the more necessary for those pitches to blast through from the orchestra. Looking at the full score, we see that these piercing A flats have been set up by the upper winds, horns, and violins long before the tutti chord. Rimsky-Korsakov, the showman, very helpfully tells his stars to sing their octave for as long as they like during the tutti, and follows their duo aria with a bit of diminuendo tremolo in the violins, which might be held as a fermata while the audience shows their appreciation. So let's look at root octaves just as we did before, this time noting their strength rather than their restraint. The piccolo plus all the tremolo first violins digging away at that top A flat will sound terrifically bright, just one degree below shrieking. This brings to mind Tchaikovsky using the piccolo rather than flutes to double super high first violins in his Romeo and Juliet fantasy overture. The next pitch down is covered simply by the first trumpet and tremolo second violins. But wait, you might ask, if first trumpet on the root wasn't as strong on the previous chord in the last video, why should it be so strong here? The answer is simply that here it's being played above the staff, where it's naturally twice as brilliant and penetrating. The second violins are also much more focused, all together on an octave below the firsts. On the next pitch down, English horn and second trumpet are quite enough to be doubling the tenor, who will be listening to the pitches an octave or two above, more than the unison on his own pitch for reference. The lower triple A flat octave is very simply and directly scored, with second and fourth horns on top. Unison bassoons, bass trombones, rolled timpani, and tremolo cellos in the middle, and double basses on the bottom. As in previous chords, we see more weight placed an octave above the very lowest note, with Rimsky-Korsakov avoiding too much weight at the very bottom. You don't always have to bring out the heavy artillery for a massive tutti chord. So all we need to do now is fill in the spaces between the octaves, with the flutes taking the upper E-flat and C, oboes and clarinets teaming up to fill the next gap. First and third horn taking the E-flat below that, over the first trombone's middle C, with the violas added for energy and tone weight, but not much power of their own. And second trombone adding that lowest E-flat in the middle of the bass staff. While you can see progressively more power being added on the way down, in no way do these thirds and fifths dominate the proceedings. The next chord, from the orchestral interlude that follows that last scene in the same opera, takes a little setup, putting it in context with the musical passage which it concludes. From the beginning of the presto, we see a flurrying fanfare with upper winds doubling upper strings, with syncopated mid-range chords from brass and bassoons, punctuated by timpani strokes, pizzicato triple stop cellos, and pizzicato double basses. The harmonic focus is really pinpointed on the pitches played by first trumpet, third and fourth horns, 
and a tripling of second bassoon, bass trombone, and pizzicato cellos. Rimsky-Korsakov wants to emphasize the change of that harmonic slot from the five of the F-flat major chord, sounding C-flat or enharmonically as B in the cellos, up a half-step to the median of the A-flat chord, sounding C. There are some further harmonic changes to set up the final chord, but the point is that the destination of C is incredibly important and has to stay audible. Meanwhile, the separation between different musical functions is leading to a conclusion in which two distinct musical colors will be heard between the upper and lower registers of the orchestra. And that's why we see Rimsky-Korsakov breaking his own customary habit of filling in every single harmonic pitch from top to bottom in a tutti chord. The central E-flat is completely left out, so that the median, shared by first bassoon, first trombone, and violas, will still ring out from the center of the sound picture. Below this, we see a pretty standard triple octave root, with second and fourth horns sharing the upper A-flat with second trumpet and upper divisi tremolo cellos, bass trombone, timpani, and lower divisi cellos on the middle A-flat, and our foundational standard team-up of contrabassoon tuba and tremolo double basses on the bottom A-flat. Just as in the last tutti chord and so many others by Rimsky-Korsakov, second trombone takes the dominant pitch of the chord inside the bass staff, with a little doubling from second bassoon and tremolo violas. That's all very rich and firmly grounded, but the point is that the missing E-flat now serves as a boundary between this lower chord, all very dark and intense, with a median on top, versus the bright, radiant A-flat octave chord above. The most telling feature here is that the piccolo drops down an octave to play unison at the top A-flat with flutes and first clarinet. To leave it higher would be to lessen the impact of the mediant and the division between colors across the scope of the chord. The middle of the chord is filled in with oboes doubling second and third clarinets, as we've seen before in other chords. And the bottom combines warm English horn and very firm first and third horns with bright first and third trumpets. The brass on the bottom reinforce the winds above, so long as they don't overplay their hand and the interlocking tremolo violins add a cushion of color and excitement across the whole upper section of harmony. Let's have another listen now, and think about how the separation of textures works to create another unique soundscape, all while stressing the median as much as possible. The final chord from Table 2 marks the beginning of a whole series of chords that leave out the string section the rest of which we'll be studying in the next Tutti Chords video. For now, though, notice not only the reduction in orchestral size, but also in dynamic strength. In fact, this is the first chord that's not forte or fortissimo or triple forte across all these tables of Tutti Chords. Instead, it's a cool, serene, perfectly balanced pianissimo. Once again, we hear the emphasis on the median, not only from the top of the chord, but also very naturally from the middle. But let's start at the top and work our way down. The capstone of this architecture is simplicity itself, tripled pitches from all the upper winds in a 6-4 voicing. This is the ultimate ideal of combining the tones of a triad using three members of the same woodwind family that we'll see in Rimsky-Korsakov's third chapter of the Principles of Orchestration, on harmony, except overlaid with all the upper winds in a very fine note-for-note -note tripling. This is done right in the sweet spot of all three instruments, where they'll mutually balance in timbre and resonance. As to the lower part of the chord, let's start with the horns which you'll notice are scored in a section of six players, and we see that they cover over two octaves of range in a beautifully balanced voicing. 
Viewers who've watched my video tip about scoring six to eight horns will notice the intriguing pitch order here, with the two groups of three horns interlocking rather than stacked. Placing the low horn of the top staff between the two lowest horns of the bottom staff. Here's an example of an instrument, usually judged to be somewhat weaker and less consequential, actually dominating the tone in a softer chord. This is because the rounder timbre of horns has a fuller resonance in gentler dynamics than the more direct tone of trumpets and trombones. Nevertheless, the combination of conical horns and cylindrical heavy brass results in a beautifully golden tone, with trumpets doubling on the same 6-4 voicing as the top three horns, and trombones doubling the root and lower median of the lower horns, but the second trombone adding a lower dominant pitch to stabilize the chord, as we've seen now in several other examples both adding to the richness and putting more weight on that same lower median. The bassoons add on their pitches to that F-third at the top of the bass staff, while bass clarinet and softly rolled timpani help stabilize the fourth horn alongside the bass trombone on that low F. Notice the odd scoring here of bass clarinet using the bass staff, where before we've seen it scored in the treble clef. That's because Rimsky-Korsakov, just like his student Stravinsky, used a hybrid system for notating bass clarinet pitches, treble clef sounding down a major ninth for all pitches above written middle B, and then bass clef sounding down a major second for all pitches below that note. Do not use this scoring convention yourself under any conditions. Bass clarinet players are perfectly capable of reading ledger lines under the treble clef all the way down to written C below middle C without any problems whatsoever. Stick with treble clef in all cases and leave this hybrid system in the past where it belongs. Okay, back to the chord analysis. Tuba underpins the beautiful round horn tone on that rock bottom F, really bringing out its own conical sound rather than just adding weight. There's one more beautiful, unique feature showing that contrabassoon doesn't always have to just double the lowest pitch with tuba. As we see here in its position of another dominant tone added between the two lowest root Fs. In a louder, more fully orchestrated chord, especially with the string section back in the mix, that kind of harmonic thickness would sound positively stodgy. But here in this cool, tranquilly nocturnal wind band chord, it's a perfectly acceptable way of enriching the mid-range of the sound picture, though I wouldn't make it a habit in every single chord. A big shout out to my Patreon crowd for helping to keep me on track no matter how many different commissions, last minute emergency fixes on other composers' projects, and the vagaries of day-to-day -day life may distract me from producing this kind of content for you all. This channel owes everything to their support. Thanks, you lovely orchestrators. See you all very soon. <laughs>